Welcome back for another lesson on the life of Jesus. In today's message, we're going to pick up where we left off in Matthew 16. But before we do that, we need to do a quick review of the last lesson because it's directly connected to where we are today. Well, last week's text was in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. And in that text, Jesus acknowledged the fact that he indeed was the Messiah. He tells his disciples that he is building something. He is his own gathering, his own house, his his ecclesia. And he, he tells his disciples that they all, they all have a special role as a part of the foundation of this house. However, something is going to happen. And it's going to appear that all is lost. That he has failed and that all that they had done, all that they had gone through, was for nothing. But then he says... The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. In other words, even death cannot keep this house from being built. Now, it's no coincidence that after Jesus tells his disciples this, that he began to talk about what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem and how he was going to die but be raised on the third day. This makes it very obvious that when Jesus made reference to the gates of Hades, that he was talking about his own death and his resurrection. He was saying, not even death can keep this from happening because he is going to conquer death through the resurrection. Now, they didn't necessarily grasp all of this, but nevertheless, it's what he was talking about. So in today's text, Matthew continues his account of the conversation Jesus had with his disciples. Our text is Matthew 16, verses 21 through 26, with parallel accounts in Mark 8, 31 through 37, and Luke 9, 22 through 25. Again, our primary text will be Matthew. All right, so let's now pick up in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, so essentially the Sanhedrin, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Now we estimate that we are a little over six months away from the crucifixion, and this is the first time Jesus specifically mentions any of this, but he does continue to bring it up hereafter. We find the second time in Matthew 17, and the third time is found in Matthew 20. It's obviously an appropriate time to begin to prepare his disciples for what's to come. And it does seem that they did grasp something from what Jesus was telling them. But how much, we cannot be certain. It does at least seem to me that they picked up on the fact that he would suffer at the hands of the religious leaders in Jerusalem and possibly be killed. Because when we fast forward, though, to the end of the story we find the disciples hiding in fear. They don't seem to have any idea of what was going to happen after his death. John said that they had not yet understood the scriptures that said he would be raised from the dead. Nevertheless, Jesus did grab their attention. And we see this with how Peter responds. In verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you. In the Greek, uh, this might be translated as, God forbid, or God be merciful. So Peter says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. So Peter pulls Jesus aside to speak with him privately, and he uses this strong language to say, this will not happen. See, in the New Testament Greek, Peter uses a double negative, which in the Greek actually intensifies the negative. So Peter says, this is not going to happen, which I think explains a little how Jesus responds to Peter. Verse 23, but he turned, and it's interesting because the word turned here uh, is a Greek word that can mean to turn around to see something or even to turn your back to someone. And some people put a whole lot of emphasis on whether Jesus was facing Peter or his back was to Peter. But I believe that regardless of the position Jesus stood in, you get the import of what he's saying. He tells Peter to get behind me, Satan. And remember the word Satan here is just a Hebrew word for adversary. He says, you are a hindrance. And here's another interesting word, because the word hindrance here sometimes translated stumbling block. It means a stick, or, or, or should we say a trigger of a trap, the mechanism that triggers the trap. And so Peter is the mechanism that triggers a trap. And Jesus says, this is who you are to me. Far. You are not setting your mind. This is another word that's interesting. Uh, Setting your mind means to have an understanding, to think, to direct one's mind, to strive for an understanding of something. 
And Jesus says that, Peter, your mind is not directed on the things of God, but on the things of men. And I think that could be understood in understanding maybe what Peter's perspective or expectations of the Messiah would be. So you see, on the one hand, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. But on the other hand, I think Peter's reaction to this demonstrates his own belief or understanding of what being the Messiah meant. You see, the things that Jesus says are going to happen to him were in opposition to Peter's view of the Messiah. Uh, For the Messiah to suffer and possibly be killed went against what Peter thought would happen and how things would work out now that the Messiah was here. See, Peter's perspective seems to have been really no different than, say, those who tried to make Jesus king by force in John chapter 6, verse 15. They had certain expectations of what he would do as king. One most certainly was to defeat the Roman occupation and maybe usher in this era where Israel would regain its rightful position, serving as a a liaison of sorts between God and the rest of the nations. Now, how do you think they would have reacted if they would have learned that this is not what Jesus was going to do? Might they think they had another false messiah on their hands? You see, this was their perspective and their expectations. Now, consider what happens when your perspective is challenged and your expectations are not met. Now, imagine being Peter. And with these words, get behind me, Jesus essentially puts Peter in his proper place. And that explanation can be seen in verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me. Incidentally, these are the same words used in verse 23, translated, get behind me. Jesus says, let him deny himself, literally completely deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me, literally keep on following me. Which is exactly what Peter needs to do. He needs to let go of his expectations. Expectations that he obtained from his upbringing, from what he was taught, the general Jewish consensus of how things were supposed to pan out. And in this way, he must die to himself and follow Jesus, regardless of what happens. Now, this isn't the first time this analogy is used. It's used in Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus sent his disciples out on their own for the first time, where they experienced for the first time what it was like to go at it without Jesus without Jesus being physically present with them. See, they stepped out of his shadow, off the sidelines, and began to do what Jesus was preparing them to do. And I think it's very fitting that this analogy is being used at this time as Jesus prepares them for what's to come. They will, once again, find themselves without Jesus, being physically there with them. And in fact, there are things that are going to to challenge them um, in ways that they have never been challenged before. Their perspective and expectations of the Messiah will be challenged. Their calling as the disciples of Jesus will be challenged. Their their physical lives will be challenged as a result of what's going to ultimately happen. And then Jesus goes on to present a paradoxical analogy to continue to challenge them. Now, a paradox is a statement that seems absurd or contradictory, and it it has a way of challenging the mind to think beyond what it what it might usually consider. And I think this is very fitting considering the fact that what people thought the Messiah would be and and expectations they had of the Messiah, yeah, that was, they needed to think beyond what they had normally considered. And so Jesus goes on in verse 25 and says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And see, the disciples The disciples are going to experience some things, again, that that are going to challenge their expectations. And as a result of these expectations being challenged, consider, Judas will betray Jesus. Then Jesus being arrested and crucified is going to make them question so many more things. Like during the process, they're going to be tempted to protect themselves, which they will. They will all flee. And Peter will deny he even knows Jesus. And, And then Judas will hang himself as the rest hide in fear. But here's the thing. The resurrection will reveal to them new perspectives and new expectations. It will will be in these moments that they will find the strength and drive to forfeit themselves for the sake of Jesus in a a very literal way. 
this no doubt is what inspired Paul to say in Galatians 2.20, that I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. See, there is the denying of self, taking up the cross and following Jesus. And then he goes on to say, The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, there, there is the new life that he has found. Now, we might be tempted to just apply all of Jesus' words here to what happens after we die or when Jesus returned, but don't miss the realities of, of them in the here and now and in the immediate times of the disciples to whom Jesus was talking, especially with the disciples. See, if their rabbi was put to death, what were they to expect would happen to them? Continuing to follow Jesus may very literally lead to their own deaths. So they would, they would be confronted with a real decision. Do they wish to continue to follow Jesus? What was he worth to them? Or do they wish to save their lives? Then Jesus gives a short parable for further consideration. In verse 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? And it's important to note that the word soul here is oftentimes translated life. There are at least two different approaches to interpreting this parable, and actually probably a few more, but I'm going to present two. One way is to essentially look at this as Jesus is presenting or demonstrating what kind of bargain you're getting. If a man is offered even the whole world in exchange for his life or being killed, right, his soul or his life, how sensible is that? Uh, one would keep his life, right? There's no bargain in all of that. And Jesus says in the same way, to preserve one's reputation and wealth in this life by siding against him, well, it's senseless, for it means they will lose their life in the age to come. Now, this is one way some interpret this passage. And I can see the angle. But I think there is another way. So let's read the passage again. Jesus says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Well, the obvious answer is, well, he will have truly gained nothing, right? And Jesus goes on to say, Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? I think the answer would be anything and everything. Like, no ransom would be too great, right? Maybe to put it another way, we might ask, What are you willing to give up to obtain all the protection, honor, and wealth the world has to offer? Or... What are you willing to give up to obtain everything Jesus has to offer? See, these are real questions, real scenarios that they are going to have to consider as they move forward with Jesus, living in this honor-shame society in which they find themselves. And that's important to remember as we move forward. So Jesus continues to talk, continues the conversation. And to look at what he says, we're going to look at Luke's account. In Luke chapter 9, verse 26, Luke writes, For whoever is ashamed of me... And of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Now the question arises, why would they be ashamed of Jesus and his words at all? And the answer would be, because of how others reacted towards them. They might be shamed and dishonored in the eyes of others. Therefore, they might feel ashamed. See, in this verse, you have two scenarios. Imagine how you would feel if you continue to follow Jesus. He's your rabbi, but he's put to death for so-called blaspheming and heresy. Now imagine how you would feel as others looked down at you and mocked you and disparaged you for being his disciple. And in that culture, they functioned in an honor-shame society. And if that, was what, if that was of more value to you, you would probably feel ashamed. And this might be a real temptation in the absence of Jesus. Now imagine how you would feel if you gave into the pressures of the society around you, but then Jesus returned. How would you then feel? Maybe shame because of what you've done? Consider Peter. Now he felt. Shame because of how you gave into the pressures and denied the honor that was due to Jesus. It's like Jesus is saying, you can endure the shame now, and feel vindicated later, or you can vindicate yourself now and feel the shame later. So I think 
all in all, this is a call for the disciples to, to stay strong no matter, no matter what was to come. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say in verse 27, But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, some argue that this has everything to do with the church in the scenario that you see in Acts chapter 2. But I argue that this probably has more to do with what happens next. That is, the Mount of Transfiguration. But for that, you have to wait for Sunday's message. So grace and peace to you, and we'll talk to you soon.